Hello again. Um, if you tuned in with us the last time, you were hearing me talk about the establishment of the um, Chesapeake colonies, the tobacco colonies, Virginia, Maryland. Um, one of the unique characteristics of those colonies was that the people that were coming over were primarily people that were interested in getting rich. So they were coming for, I guess you could say, economic freedom, whereas the people in that were coming in a place that would become known as New England were coming primarily for religious freedom. I mean, that's worth noting in and of itself. But the people that I'd be referring to here would be the Pilgrims and the Puritans. Now, who are these people? Well, in short, they're religious exiles. They were people that got themselves kicked out of England. And the reason that they were kicked out was they were, um, they, they, they were very, very zealous about their religion. And they felt that uh, basically everything that people did in their everyday life constituted sin. Dancing was sin, drinking was sin, in some instances playing was sin. So, you know, they're forced out of England and initially where they head is over across the English Channel to uh, Holland. Now, in the aftermath of their voyage to Holland, they go across the Atlantic Ocean to what they thought was going to be Virginia, but ultimately uh, what would become known as the New England area. So think Massachusetts, that's what I want you to understand. Now, let's start out with the Pilgrims. Um, the guy that is in charge of the ship coming over is a guy by the name of William Bradford. Now, I shouldn't have to tell you the name of the ship that the Pilgrims were on. It should be etched into every American's uh, political consciousness, but that would be the Mayflower, right? On the Mayflower, Bradford took the league, lead rather in drafting something that would later become known as the Mayflower Compact. Very, very important document here. What the Mayflower Compact was, was a series of, um, for lack of a better way of saying it, uh, authoritarian recognitions, um, things that, uh, that the local authorities would recognize to be the Pilgrim and Puritan rights once they arrived in the New World. Um, you would have the right to this and to that, and the government would not do this or that. What historians have come to understand about the Mayflower Compact is that it really was a predecessor to what we would later come to call the Constitution. I mean, if you think about the Constitution, what it is is just a document that spells out what branch of government is in charge of what power and how much power that branch has. So anyway, the Mayflower Compact is important for the same reasons that an independent court system in Virginia and Maryland was important. It's an early form of American democracy, and so for the better part of 150 years, Americans, whether you're talking about Virginians, Marylanders, or New Englanders, have been used to having their own kind call the shots. So that's important in and of itself. Now, when Bradford and the uh, pure, uh, Pilgrims rather uh, arrived in what would become known as Plymouth Rock in 1620, they established something called the Plymouth Colony. Okay, now it would not have been possible to sustain Plymouth had it not been for the local indigenous population, the Wampanoag people. Okay, We were talking about these guys a little bit earlier in the class with uh, the Native American groups that were indigenous to the North American continent before Europeans showed up. These are the people with those long wooden houses that uh, had those animal skins uh, draped across these benches on the inside of these huts. They were agriculturalists, and they were organized at a village level, so they got along quite well with the English, considering they were coming from a very similar background. Okay, Maybe the most important and or famous uh, thing that we associate with the pilgrims and the, um, the Native Americans that befriended them would be something that occurs in 1621. Uh, it was in harvest season. And there was a truce between the Pilgrims and the uh, Native Americans. And uh, one of the ways that they solidified this truce was they ate a lot of food, and they generally complained about their enemies, a common enemy, the uh, Narragansett. Okay? Um, if this sounds familiar, it's because you're thinking of Thanksgiving. Now, you know, the Thanksgiving that you and I think of is actually quite different than the Pilgrims and the, Pur Pilgrims and the uh, Native Americans. But um, generally, that, that is where the tradition of Thanksgiving comes from, okay? And it's also a very bittersweet moment for Native Americans, considering um, it was a temporary truce, if you understand what I'm talking about. 
Now, I had a uh, assignment for you not so long ago. Uh, it was Quiz 2, and uh, one of the things that you had to read in Quiz 2 is a guy by the name of John Winthrop. And I ask you to describe to me why he felt it was okay to take these Native American lands. And one of the things that I'm hopeful that uh, that quiz left you with was, you know, the, the, that, that God had given the Puritans the right to take this land um, for a lot of different reasons, but he wanted them to have it. The Native Americans weren't using it correctly, so to speak. So religious freedom is a really important part of the Pilgrim's past and the Puritan's past. About eight years after the Plymouth Colony was established, we see the establishment of what would later become known as the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And the governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony would be our good friend John Winthrop. Now, I need you to understand, Winthrop was a really, really devout Puritan, and he envisioned uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony as just sort of the beacon of reform in the Anglican faith. That in order to really clean up the Church of England and to purify it, I'm really trying to drive that point home, you would need a New England, hence the name of the colony, New England. It all goes back to religious purification, okay? Now, it's ironic that these are people that are religious exiles that are having to flee their homeland, go across the Atlantic Ocean for religious freedom, because when they get there, one of the first things that Winthrop insists upon is you cannot be anything other than a Puritan to have any kind of say in local governing. You can't run for office, you can't hold any office, you can't vote, you can't, in some instances, own property. You're treated as a second-class citizen if, unless you're a Puritan. One of the guys that uh, Winthrop recruited to come over and help him set up the Massachusetts Bay Colony would be a guy by the name of Roger Williams, who was a leader in the Puritan faith. Now, Williams was a really important figure, and Winthrop could not wait to get him over there to Massachusetts. When he arrived in, um, in the uh, early, uh, 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 early part of the history of the colony, uh, Winthrop was really taken aback on uh, Williams' reaction to the kind of regime that he had established there in Massachusetts. Winthrop, excuse me, Williams, in short, did not like the intermixing of religion and politics. I mean, for instance, you can't even do something as simple as vote unless you're a Puritan. Williams didn't like that whatsoever. He felt that any time you mixed politics with religion, the former would have a corrupting a corrupting, you know, character on the on, on the latter. If if you mix these two together, what you're going to get is corrupt Puritan churches. Well, Winthrop was so taken aback that he basically told Roger Williams, "Just leave, just get out of here," which is exactly what Williams does. A little bit later, he goes 50 miles to the south of what you think of as Boston, and he establishes a new colony based on religious freedom called Rhode Island. Okay. Now, Williams is the founder and father of the Rhode Island Colony, and it's important because you do see a truer form of religious freedom in Rhode Island than you do with the Puritans and the Pilgrims uh, to the north of there. Okay. Now, let's stay with this idea of religious freedom for just a few more minutes. Obviously, the church was a very important part of life in uh, New England during this time period, everywhere, not just in Massachusetts or Rhode Island, but everywhere. And one of the people that really got into trouble to that end was a woman by the name of Anne Hutchinson. Now, in short order, what Anne Hutchinson used to do was conduct what you and I would think of as a Bible study in the aftermath of the service she would invite all the townspeople to her home where they would discuss the sermon, they would discuss the Bible, they would discuss a lot of religious matters. You have to understand that the Puritans were very traditionalist people and they felt that women should not be lecturing to a co-ed audience, that this was considered risque behavior, indecent behavior, and it was no place for a woman. So she got in trouble from the powers that be, including John Winthrop, um, that said that she was conducting herself in a grotesque, indecent manner and ordered her immediately to stop. Well, not only did Hutchinson refuse to stop holding these meetings, she came up with an idea that is going to be very important to the later establishment of American democracy. 
she said, all souls are created equal in the eyes of God. In other words, you don't have the right to tell me I can or cannot hold these meetings. The only person that has, or only thing that has, the ability and right to do that would be our Creator, and that's God. Now, if the idea of all souls created equal sounds familiar, it's because if you think about the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal, it's going to have a profound impact on what would later become the Founding Fathers. The idea that we are all equal upon our creation. Now, you know, we're not all equal in terms of monetary or social issues, but nonetheless, it's like the independent court system and representative government or religious freedom, generally speaking. It's another important cog in what would become known as American democracy. So Hutchinson is very important to that end. Now, you can't talk about the Puritans without talking about witchcraft. These were people that were very, very spiritual. And when they saw a baby born with a deformity or if lightning struck your house and burnt it to the ground, that was clearly a sign that God was interacting in human affairs and wanted you and or your family and or your town to repent, to, to, to reform your ways. Well, over the course of time, um, what you see happening is a lot of people being accused of being witches, being possessed by Satan and doing his evil bidding for them. One of those individuals was a woman by the name of Rebecca Nurse. Now, Rebecca Nurse, at the time that she was accused of being a witch, was approximately 70 years old, and nobody had heard a peep out of her on her Massachusetts homestead in the middle of the countryside. That is until the, the nurses, as a family, got into a little bit of a border dispute with their neighbors, the Putnams. It's a good old-fashioned um, 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 family feud, so to speak. But nonetheless, when this thing goes to trial, the court finds in favor of the nurses. Not content in the decision, it was the Putnams that not only challenged the decision, but accused Rebecca Nurse, a 70-year-old woman, of being a witch, being possessed, and possessing them, tormenting, torturing them, these evil spirits, so to speak. Well, the case went to trial, and ultimately um, it was dismissed. Uh, the jury said, you haven't presented adequate evidence to prove the claim that she's a witch, and therefore we're going to let her go. Not content in the jury's decision, uh, many of the witnesses, including some of the Putnam's, really threw themselves into these fits and they just uh, put on a real show for the courtroom saying that these spirits that were commanded by Rebecca Nurse were in the courtroom with them right now strangling them and choking them and kicking them and possessing them and as you might imagine it really convinced the jury to reverse that decision and Rebecca Nurse was put to death by hanging. As a matter of fact in Salem, uh, Massachusetts just outside of Boston over a dozen individuals, men and women, were, um, were, were executed for uh, accused of being witches. Now, over the course of time, after uh, 1892, there's a lot of people that are really put off by these, um, these witch trials, so to speak, the Salem witch trials. And uh, they, they begin to say, you know what, when, when lightning crashes or when a baby is born in deformities, it's, it's the laws of nature. There are scientific, logical explanations for this, not some old man in the sky that is deciding to intervene in human affairs directly. One of those individuals would be Benjamin Franklin, who would not only discover um, electricity through his kite experiments, he would also um, be able to explain in a very scientific, logical manner uh, the, the, the laws of nature. Okay, So anyway... This whole idea of witchcraft is, is not going to go anywhere in American life. Um, if you think about it, one of the things that would shred you, just destroy any kind of favorable reputation that you would have, would be calling somebody or something a witch. And so um, later on, you fast forward approximately 100 years, and in the, uh, in, uh, actually it was more than 100 years, but uh, you fast forward into the future, into the 1950s, if you wanted to destroy somebody's reputation, you didn't call them a witch, you called them a communist. They didn't have to have any proof, just like the Putnams really didn't have any proof. Accusation alone was enough, uh, enough to just destroy somebody's reputation. 
So this whole idea of a quote-unquote witch hunt is something that's going to be staying in American life for a long, long time. Again, fast forward into our modern times, if you want to call it, you want to shred somebody of any kind of credibility, don't call them a communist, call them a terrorist or a terrorist sympathizer. Now, all that being said, I would much, much rather have lived in the Massachusetts, New England area rather than the Virginia area, especially being working class. One of the things that the Puritans felt very, very adamantly about was that individuals needed their own plot of land. Why? Well, if you had a job to do, and what job is more labor-intensive than being a farmer, right? If you had a job to do, you were up teen times less likely to get yourself involved in any kind of trouble. For those of you that have heard the expression, idle hands are the devil's workshop, that was something that the Puritans really lived by and practiced day by day. So pretty much everybody in the New England area had a plot of land to work. Now I'm not going to sit here and say that everybody had equal amounts or that the quality of land was always equal. Certainly that was not the case. There were rich people and poor people just like there were in Virginia. But there's an enormous amount of opportunity in places like Boston that just simply does not exist in Virginia. Generally speaking, in Virginia, if you were born into poverty, you tended to die in poverty. You do see a lot more social mobility in um, New England than you do south in the Chesapeake colonies. And the primary reason is the diversification of the New England economy. There's only so long that you can go on spreading out these farms and dividing them up and giving people their own plot of land. Eventually, what's going to happen was what happened in London 200 years before. People are going to have to find a new trade, a new niche in the economy. And so, in a lot of instances, what you see is the development of shoemaking as a craft, as in later an industry, of metalworking, a craft, and an industry, baking, fisheries, uh, corn grinding, milling, um, uh, uh, craft, and industries. So there's a lot more opportunity to thrive in New England rather than there would be in places like uh, Virginia and to a lesser extent Maryland. Now what I'm hopeful that I've pressed upon you is even though you've got the English colonizing uh, what you would think of as New England and uh, the Chesapeake area, they're very different in terms of the people that are going there and the purposes that they have in terms of going there. What we'll continue to talk about as it relates to the further colonization of what you think of as the eastern half of the United States is more social diversification and economic diversification as time unfolds. But again, I want you to keep in the back of your mind that a lot of these people are bringing ideas across the Atlantic Ocean in terms of how this new world should look. And one of the things that they're continuously bringing across the ocean is this democratic tradition. It's so maybe not democratic by our standards, but nonetheless, things like you know the, the idea of all souls being created equal or having an independent court system are really going to take a hold of the colonists in the New World and really going to help really kind of establish who they are as a people. And certainly by the, the dawn of the 18th century, this is good and solidified, okay? So that's where I'm going to leave it for right now.